the most, most traditional form of economic practice. All the elders of the um, last centuries, those who have been wise, they have been practicing some sort of circular economy, which means waste not, want not. Minimize the waste. What has happened in the last industrial revolution to us is wasteful approach to environment and production. So uh, the reason we have climate change now is that the emissions that we created, those who created it never took any responsibility, they pumped it into the atmosphere. So atmosphere had saturation limit. We have crossed that saturation limit. It can't take anymore. It's kicking back and hence it shows temperature rise, which is giving trouble uh, in various ways. Temperature has risen by above one degree between one to 1.3 right now. So we have got some problems. Uh, in the basic um, concepts of um, good practice in economy has been the principle of three R's, as you all know. The R's are reduce. So you reduce the waste, you reduce the uh, input that you need and keep it so that optimum input can be used and not waste. So reduce, reuse, use wherever possible and recycle. What can be recycled? You take it, plastic is a good example. Uh, uh, industrial uh, parts of uh, uh, energy component, energy uh, industry, agriculture, you name it, water industry, you know, those three principles of reuse, recycle, and reduce are essential. And that has been going on for about good 30 years now. However, one has realized that three hours are not enough. What we have to do now is reduce waste, not only just reduce them, but recycle the waste into the system. So waste of one part of the component of a process becomes the feedback or the feed or the input. So output of a process within a defined structure because input of the process is another part of the structure. That's how what is called circular is basically you want to use up all the material, all the chemical components, all the energy components and maximize it so that one helps the other rather not hinders or go against the other. So a lot of waste in that way. Just give you an example. We have been working on 200 uh, uh, garments textile industries just by improving compliance. What they are supposed to do, can they do it? You know, in a gas has been leaking somewhere. Young people went around walking, said, hey, there's some gas leaking here, water dripping there. You know, it looks like that energy in this system is too much. What is causing this waste of energy? Where is it? Can we reduce it? And that way, something like 10 to 15% of reduction of greenhouse gas emission, about 10% reduction of water, about 15% reduction of chemicals has taken place. And IFC has done what is called PAC1, PAC2, two major projects in Bangladesh, particularly in the textile and garment industries, and shown that it is quite resounding. And the industries like it because it saves their time, it saves their energy. So that is the background to um, circular economy and climate change. I'm, not, I'm being erratic and not being very systematic or analytical or academic in my presentation. The second question that if they had requested is COVID and climate change. Well, these are two biggest mega processes that we have known for a quite a while, minus, you know, in the last 10 decades or so, we have had famines, which have had catastrophic influence on society, tremendous influence over the globe at various points in history. But climate change has been a great challenge. Sometimes it's not so visible in some countries or ecosystem. In a country like Bangladesh, as you all know, about 1.5 to 2.5% of the GDP is eaten up 
is taken away by the extreme events of related to climate change, such as number of cyclones, floods, water logging, um, river bank erosion, coastal intrusion of salt water, salt water penetration into the agricultural system and reducing the production. But at the same time, Bangladesh's achievements in agriculture is phenomenal. In 1971, when we were there, the population was, you know, uh, about 75 million people. Now we have 170 million people. At, in 1971, there was a food shortage, absolute food shortage, and we could not feed everybody. And you might recall that in 1974, there was a real shortage of food and tremendous um, uh, political um, disturbance. Come 2021, virtually we are feeding everybody with the basic carbohydrates. So rice, wheat, maize, uh, is the basic plus potato now is supplying the carbohydrate for the country along with other vegetables, et cetera. But there has been multiple diversified revolution in agriculture, in horticulture, in aquaculture and fish, in ponds, tremendous amount of development. Um, in fruits, some fruits like watermelon, something that was a luxury at a certain point has become a market product because this is amenable to the ecosystem of the char land, the uh, floating or the small islands in the middle of the river, the ecosystem supports watermelon production and tremendous amounts have been happening. So at one level, we the innovation of the communities of the people and industries have done very well. The transport system in Bangladesh has improved. So some of the products which could not be brought into the uh, base market of Dhaka, Chirogong, Russia, or the bigger cities is now much more possible. This year, one hopes there will be a mango. Uh, you know, people have been calling industrial mango production uh, will be at a boom this year, one hopes. So far, so good, the weather has held right now until then. Uh, but COVID and climate change are two mega processes which has converged as the worst possible time for the development of Bangladesh. On the other hand, our development process, particularly the macro development processes of big industry, big bridges, for the bridge or big road construction, um, our Dhaka is getting its own first uh, um, air transit uh, or, uh, you know, uh, rail line, uh, electronic rail line is coming in, et cetera, et cetera. That is going well, but at the same time, our poverty numbers are increasing in big time. Many of the poor or recently out of poverty people have gone back to poverty and a new poverty group has come in and anything between additional 15% population has gone back into poverty because of COVID and uh, climate change merging together. We work with a number of people across the country and one of the women in Kurigram, I asked her, how is she managing COVID? And she said, I had four floods in the last six months. That's about four months ago. There was a four consecutive flood uh, over a period of four or five months. She said, I am between knee deep and waist deep water for four months. I don't have the luxury of attending to COVID. So basically, it's a question of, you know, you don't have the right to choose between your devils, they come and haunt you. So the uh, disasters that we have are multiple in nature. Some of them are too big in terms of what can be immediately done. So what we are good at is adapting to it or communities have been adapting. Now government, fortunately, as you might know, Bangladesh has created a ministry of uh, disaster management and relief. And they have done reasonably well to be able to look at a signal of disaster, prepare themselves, give the food aid or support wherever possible. And the system of um, local level government is working, not at its best, but reasonably working well in terms of 
creating delivery and giving the delivery system. So despite the worst, as I said, this consecutive four floods, there hasn't been a, what can be called starvation death, dead body on the road, on the canal somewhere because they didn't get food. That didn't happen. So we have managed food reasonably well or managing commercially, but poor don't have the money to buy the food that is in the market. And obviously there are, you know, market manipulation of food is one of the most vulnerable manipulation. Uh, the other world is energy. And in energy, Bangladesh has done pretty well. And thanks to the present government of taking it, I'll, I'll shut up in a minute. Uh, the, the, the energy system is that electricity has virtually reached most people. And this is what used to be blackout and brownout, as you know, virtually almost none. So we have reduced in the villages, in the other areas, yes, there is brownout not enough voltage, et cetera. But pretty much cities are being served. The government, and I had something to do with it, luckily, that we have created a new, uh, call it jargon, call it um, cliche, or call it a declaration, is basically we said, I said, the Bangladesh doesn't have real cities. These are big elevated slums, and Bangladesh is too crowded to just focus on the cities as such. The whole country is like a city. So now Bangladesh has a, the present uh, leadership has a program called Amar Gram, Amar Shaur, My Village, My Town. So simultaneous development of village and towns at the same time, keeping agriculture in the center, keeping growth. But what we need to do is much better development of human skill. That's where we have to go on. I'll stop there. Just saying that climate change, COVID, submergence and convergence remains a great threat, but nonetheless, people are trying to cope. Not terribly scientifically, not very well organized, not systemic, industries are suffering from that, but nonetheless, people are trying their best, poor are paying a price, which are having reasonably good time, and Bangladesh overall is moving. So uh, this is the... Uh, few random thoughts that I had in the uh, market of a circular economy. So in the yeah. circular economy, uh, we have to pull everybody in together to meet their minimum needs. Otherwise, there will be political frustration and put circularity in the back bench. We don't want that. So keeping this balanced uh, distribution is as important as higher production and less productive system through the circular economy. Let me stop there. No, I think, th thanks, Atibai. That's, uh, and I think one of the, the other thing, maybe we can come back to it in the Q&A and bring you in on that. But I think that we also need to address um, uh, coming up to COP26. Oh, um, I didn't do that. Can I do it in one minute? Yeah, what, please, please go ahead. Two minutes. Uh, well, COP26 has created uh, huge expectations. And this is mainly because the global regime of climate change has shifted dramatically with Biden coming in and thank God exit of Trump created a new impetus in which US is part of the system and the sounds that Biden has made, particularly the meeting he organized with 20 or 40 heads of government, et cetera, well, our head of government was there as well. And a discussion that what can uh, U US do, and US has been saying, you know, it is, Biden has put it, quoted it in terms of enlightened self-interest for US, which is create one to five million jobs out of climate and energy, modern energy system, which is improved. So basically he wants to use that to re-stimulate economy in USA, but at the same time, give a impetus to climate change discussion, negotiation, and makes it much better. So Europe, US, well, UK is no more a big player minus in outside Europe, but still remains a player. Um, and then Australia and others. So all of them pulled together, the North-South dichotomy and the uh, discourse that was there, and the frustration with Trump world, of and US being out of the discussion did not help 
Europe to take the type of leadership that was required. Now there is a leadership and hopefully that will come up. So COP26 has two part of it. One is the political part, as I said, other is the technical negotiation part. And there are thorny issues, many of them. One thorny issue is what is called loss and damage. I don't know most of the people whether you understand this difference. You know, loss and damage is an entity in which whatever happens under climate change extreme events, there will be huge losses to the ecosystem, to the industrial system, to the roads, etc. And economic activities are also to the lives and livelihood of the poor, as well as ecosystem and agriculture. And that is beyond adaptation. What is beyond adaptation but cannot be adapted easily is called loss and damage. The rich countries have said, you can talk about loss and damage, but you cannot use two words. One is compensation, one is attribution. The compensation means you cannot ask money from them for this. Second is you cannot say who is responsible. You can't say it is these people. So they have kept that without talking these two words, we can talk now business. No, you know that that will be very difficult to talk business without those two words. So this is the thorny political issue that will reach uh, uh, the COP26 as a issue, but there are other outstanding issues. Much of the work progress in uh, implementing of the Paris Agreement had made progress. Some of them are good progress. This is one area which is still remains uh, contentious and has to be handled. Uh, whole negotiation process, as you know, is a block negotiation process. The rich countries have a block. The poor countries have a block. The LDC, least developed countries, they have a block within the poor countries block of the LDC block within uh, G77 China. China is now the world's greatest emitter, but legally in the block system, they're part of the, you know, supposed beneficiary of the system. So others don't like it. They're one of the richest countries now, second richest country going to be the richest country in the world. So there are these internal um, stresses which will show up uh, in, in COP26. So COP26 is wanting to give solution because there was, it has been delayed by a year, as you know, this was supposed to happen in 2020, November, didn't happen, came to 2021. There is a 50 possibility that it could be virtual. If it's virtual, you don't do negotiation virtually because all negotiation, successful negotiation is all done in secret. Is your, I think, are you still there? I think your video is frozen. We just lost you for a sec. So overall, that's where we are now. Let yeah. me stop there saying COP26 is a possibility. Let's not build too much expectation from this. This is like any other COP. People in COP, they don't do negotiation. They do copying. Copying is an art form, is a science, is a stupidity in its own right of negotiation. So... It's a system in which countries will probably go or not go through virtual. We don't know yet where we are. Nobody knows, nobody can predict. So it depends on how we are going forward. Let me stop there. Okay, thanks very much, Atikbai. That was very helpful. So I, I, the reason I wanted to bring in COP26 is firstly, it's in the UK. Um, uh, UK government has, uh, is very committed uh, and Boris Johnson's government for all its failings is very committed to the COP26 process. And I would like, uh, I think there is a unique opportunity uh, between Pathfinder, which is this, uh, you, know, um, you know, entrepreneurship focused platform, and also the link between UK and Bangladesh. So I would like nearer the time of COP26 to have a, a more, a larger, more detailed uh, webinar, uh, where we can actually come forward with some ideas. The reason I, I'm very grateful that you joined at such short notice is because I think, you know, you and I have, I mean, uh, maybe everybody else in the court doesn't realize, I think by and, and I have been trying and, and, and Syed, the three of us have been meeting and trying for four years. And, uh, but sometimes uh, it's like waiting for Godot. And maybe it's the total, you know, we, we can eventually, maybe 20, you know, 2021 will be the year where, you know, our collective uh, partnership efforts come together. So 
I think that rather than, you know, Bangladesh is the largest, most vulnerable country and uh, uh, is, the, is the largest MBC and, and the Honorable Prime Minister is, is the head of, I don't know, whether the new committee, whatever they call it now. But I, I guess basically... Sorry. Vulnerable, vulnerable country forum. Okay, vulnerable country forum. But, but, and, and I think, but I think the thing is, uh, rather than pushing first world guilt trip money, so rather than yeah. saying, with what I call it, rather than saying, look, you've caused all these problems, you owe us, I think that uh, we can, in our own small little way, come up with actual business opportunities for a green recovery that makes sense for countries like the UK or US or, or EU and Bangladesh. We can start between the UK and Bangladesh. So I think if we look at it as a, uh, an economic opportunity to build a green sustainable recovery and come up with some specific business ideas, then at both a government level and also at a, at a business level, I think there's a lot of opportunities. So that's one of the things, maybe we can come back to it in the Q&A. The reason I'll now move on to, uh, the reason I'm, I'm very uh, uh, grateful that again, also at short notice that Professor Monem has uh, joined uh, is because I think, I think something I think by you and I have talked about before, I think we need to have a, a partnership between our business schools, like IBA is the leading business school in Bangladesh, and our engineering university, like Bwet or Dhaka University, and also some, some think tanks and NGOs like BCAS. Um, and we can do something similar in the UK. Uh, I think that um, I'll get, uh, uh, you know, Anwar Ali OB, who's uh, won his OB this January for, for sustainable business, business um, social business. Um, so we're, we're, he can talk a bit about the opportunities in circular economy in a minute, but I think that if we can combine UK Bangladesh and also business and, and science uh, and between the private sector and some so, and, you know, and academia, we can do a lot of things. So I'm hoping from this discussion, uh, we can also find a way for uh, IBA uh, and Dhaka University to, to, to collaborate. So I think also, Mormon Bai, if you don't mind saying a few words and then we'll go to maybe to um, uh, Anwar, Ali, if he's on, um, but I wanted to, you know, and again, I know you haven't, doesn't have to be a formal presentation, but uh, I think um, Mumbai is also in a unique position because he's also just, he is also director of a pride group and also uh, just retired, recently retired as a director of BGMEA. So has been involved in sustainable issues. So I think uh, Professor Monam, do you, want, do, you, do you want to make a quick moment, moment sorry, do you, do you want to make a quick comment? Yeah, thank you very much, Ifti. And uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me this opportunity to speak in this August gathering. Uh, I'll just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not ready, as you have been already mentioned, uh, that with the presentation or anything, but I have uh, jotted down a few points that I'm going to uh, focus on uh, during this very short uh, uh, statement of mine. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, as if they have already mentioned that uh, we are, I, I've been involved as a family business with the textile industry and I was representing the garment sector last two years. And uh, with being in that position as a board member of the BGME and I've seen the lot of various sustainable efforts that have been going on in this industry. We have to uh, keep in mind that um, this is the large single largest industry in this country and employs a good deal of people almost with RMG and textile, it's more than 10 million people. And uh, there are also linkage industries. And, and this is one, as uh, Professor Atik already mentioned, this was one of the biggest polluter was at least uh, in the past. And now over the years, it has turned out to be you know, more and more green. And uh, probably Bangladesh is the single largest country with green factories in, this country, in, in the world. Uh, those are a few things that has happened. In factories, most factories are now having the fluent treatment plant. They're having the recycling, the, the waste energy in terms of I mean, cogeneration. I mean, the exhaust of generator is used to produce steam. They're uh, uh, collecting the waste heat with, uh, with the heat transfer equipment. They're harvesting rainwater. Uh, I've been uh, mentioned a few of the, the initiatives that is already almost like a standard uh, practice for good uh, exporters. Having said that, uh, the 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 I mean the overall uh, you know uh, 
reward for using such a thing not reward it should be you know the, the i mean it is not being rewarded nicely by, by the buyers that means that if you can have a green factory there is not a green price so there's there's something that we need to look at and the other thing is uh this industry uh, is probably as a forefront of of uh, globally also as a polluter so and because of the fast fashion there's a lot of lot of you know textile eventually ends up in the dump so that is landfilling so there are efforts going on to recycle reuse and uh, uh, you know make it a circular economy this is i mean uh, this is not only in theory it has started to be in practice so that is where the challenges for bangladesh is there so if that happens at widespread and also with with fourth industrial revolution and digitization and if it is really happening like that you know opposite of globalization that is uh, onshoring and nearshoring this industry will be threatened to a large extent so since now at this point in time bangladesh is heavily dependent on this industry so i would urge that all these innovations especially the bangladeshi innovators should continue to 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 develop the disruptive technology that would eventually help you know this industry and other industries that could create more jobs in bangladesh uh, i see that uh, uh, you know at least uh, uh, the trends are like that that with these disruptions coming in some of them uh, would uh, you know reduce so much of jobs that there will be uh, i mean possible job loss the the digital divide is actually not helping the poor so that is something we have to you know focus going forward uh, as has been already mentioned that you know we cannot allow this because this will eventually lead to social disorder so we have to make sure that whatever innovation and whatever disruption that we also initiate and adopt that that we keep in mind that uh, the local jobs are kept though so i think there uh, this uh, in initiative of uh, you know uh, you know involving all of these tech entrepreneurs into a forefront uh, and and to the, to target our uh, problems of you know uh, of global uh, uh, climate change and also uh, the the new industrial revolution and also the politics around that so international politics around that so we need to keep bear in mind something like uh, we have to focus on a digital divide we have to focus on bangladeshi interventions that would create jobs in bangladesh and we have to reduce inequality uh, in in this is there has to be somewhat linked up when you talk about iba and the, and and the, the university academia and the engineering university collaboration i think that's a very good idea so what i see you know uh, in in most part the reason like uh, the reason our products are not internationally acclaimed especially for let's say a craft or or homemade products they don't at times match the international quality is because of the fact that there is poor a uh, uh, design aspect there is poor people don't connect with the the need of the international market and uh, what we produce so there has to be uh, a connection between that the reason our pharmaceutical is exported the reason our textile is exported is because these factories these initiatives were undertaken to cater to world market so we have satisfied all the international regulations requirement and that market demand the consumer aspirations from a product this is this has not been so in in other products in, in the, the reason we are, we cannot sell our crafts so if we can engage our craftsmen into creating products that would be you know internationally you know acceptable then we engage you know lot of people we can i think reverse the effect of job loss by fourth ir we can uh, reduce digital divide we can engage the people who are less fortunate uh, who are not trainable to this modern day technology for whatever for reasons uh, those and also maybe you know uh, their age or the social structure or their education or the background doesn't allow this kind of so there's a huge population like that for which can be transformed into this 
and their university, uh, a business school, a technological university can be of immense, uh, you know, uh, uh, use or uh, they can come together and to create local resource focused industry that creates a world market keeping sustainability and, and, and uh, you know, uh, global, you know, and this, uh, I mean, should I say, environmental challenges in mind. So with these few words, I stop here and I'll let, uh, I mean, I'll hear from other people what has to be said on this issue. And if there is any further question from whatever I said, I'm more than willing to answer that. Thank you very much, Ifti. Okay, thanks very much, Professor. So uh, might I suggest now um, uh, the following structure. We'll now have uh, three uh, quick uh, comments uh, or uh, from the, uh, let's say, panelists or the three businesses. So we'll start with uh, Maria Misbahani. Sonali Bioplastics, then we'll bring in Ahmed from, from Advanced, uh, and then uh, Ditu Mohidin about aquaculture. After we have those three, uh, let's get, get back into the business mindset. Then I'll also bring in uh, some comments from um, uh, Anwar Ali, OBE, about the op what he sees the opportunities in the UK. Uh, if Abu Said from BCAS wants to make any comments, he can do that then. And then we'll move to the Q&A and, &A and we'll, we'll try and wrap up. So I think now, uh, Mariam, do you want to jump on? And thanks for listening patiently. Okay. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you so much for hosting this. I really appreciate it, you know, putting this together. And already it's been quite educational. So I appreciate that. Uh, so do you basically, I, I speak a little bit about what we're doing. At, yeah, no, just, uh, I, I, just I think, I think uh, uh, Mariam, if you just want to, Again, this is not a formal presentation. I think what you're okay. doing is extremely innovative. So you can okay. share that. The, the, the thing is to firstly understand how you, you're, you're quickly, what is your product, but also what is your journey? You're sure. also between the US and, and Bangladesh. You're, right. you're raising money in both. And we may find a way also to launch your kind of business in the UK. So these are so, some of the themes. Right. Please. Okay. So uh, basically, Shonali Bioplastics is uh, my company. We're registered in the US. And we're also registered in Bangladesh as Shonali Bioplastics Limited here. And we are solving the plastic pollution problem with bio-based and biodegradable products. We are a startup. So therefore we have spent a lot of time uh, over just over a year uh, making our products in the lab, in different labs, putting things together, making plans, thinking what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? And now we have come to the point where we want to go to commercialization. So basically we want to get a factory going and we want to make these uh, products on a large scale. So in order to do that right now, we're looking for investment uh, to get this going. And we have selected Bangladesh as the place where we want to build our factory. There are a few different reasons for that. One of the key reasons is the one of the prime uh, raw materials that we utilize is jute and that grows in Bangladesh. So I have the uh, objective to revive jute in Bangladesh. Might be a bit of an aggressive plan, but I think it's a good idea given that for hundreds of years, it has been a beautiful plant. It has been a very useful plant. And for our work, the way that we are making the products, it is something which is beneficial. We also use other plants like uh, hemp and bamboo and et cetera. But when we were thinking our team that what do we want to utilize, we decided to use a plant that does not uh, take away from what human beings would eat. So not using an edible plant, like for example, uh, seaweed or potatoes, cassava, uh, bananas, rice, you name it. So we said that jute has a very high amount of cellulose, which we can utilize, and that's the best way for us to go. So we spent the past year, because uh, it has been a COVID situation, we've spent this year thinking about how we want to move forward and making plans. Uh, despite the hurdles, we have been quite successful in getting some customer uh, letters of intent, and we've gotten a lot of requests from people because they require these kind of products. So on the product side, we have five products in our pipeline. These products are all bio-based and all biodegradable, which is the way to go because plastic pollution, especially with single-use plastic is a huge issue. 
uh, polluting uh, our rivers, polluting the oceans, a global problem, the land, uh, microplastics is an issue now uh, for human beings. So if people in this group are familiar, plastic is all over the place and therefore we come under the climate tech as well as clean tech space with what we're doing. So one of our products is biodegradable film. So we will have the film either like in a sheet or in a roll. And then some people like to say, okay, cut that up and make it into shopping bags. So that's one of the objectives. We already have lots of requests from people because packaging is a huge industry where the plastic is utilized and it's all over the place. There's like nothing you can do about it. It doesn't biodegrade, it doesn't disappear. So therefore we are making this bio-based and biodegradable. That means it will completely biodegrade, not even uh, a compostable thing where you need to treat it with certain chemicals or go through a, a certain procedure where this will then decompose. Uh, right here in Bangladesh, we have spoken with people who are involved in the garment industry. And they said that now they have certain requirements primarily from European countries where they export to and perhaps Canada as well, where now you can't use plastic and you have to show on the packaging, is it 70-30, is it 60-40, what percentage of it is biodegradable? The Europeans are being very aggressive about their policies. Therefore, this is something that Bangladesh needs to act on. So we have also re received quite a few requests that, you know, when you will be ready, we really need to work with you on this product because this is what we need for the industry and to serve our customers' requirements to ship the garments. Besides that, we have another product which is utilized in the pharmaceutical industry. It's utilized in the food as well as in the paint industry. So it's used as a thinner, it's used as an adhesive, as an add-on. Uh, it comes in the form of a gel also as a powder. And that's also made from the cellulose of the plant. Um, besides these, we are thinking about uh, insulation, for example, for construction, either thermal insulation, acoustic insulation, as well as we can make uh, paper. I spoke with some paper industries in Bangladesh. Interestingly, they utilize uh, recycled paper. So we're thinking what else could we do about that because we want to use plants instead of wood and uh, not on the recycling side of things. So uh, we have five, these five products, uh, phase one, phase two, we wanna see how we wanna roll it out but it's uh, quite uh, an aggressive plan to get this off the ground. And we feel that this is the way to go because this is how the environment is going right now. And there's a huge need for it. You mentioned earlier, and uh, the professor spoke about the circular economy, and this is definitely a huge uh, action plan. And we are also very uh, cognizant of it because this is something that we need to do and reusing, recycling, anything that helps. As far as uh, my company, Shonali, is concerned, we are focused on dealing with the problem before it becomes a problem. So instead of having a lot of plastic pollution out there from those petroleum-based companies that are making the plastics, we can make products which are made from plants and are bio-based so they do not cause more pollution. But definitely, you know, we're very much into biodiversity and the circular economy so that we can then get this back going in action. Uh, actually, the way our mothers and grandmothers, et cetera, used to do. But now we live in a throwaway age where like, you know, you just get rid of stuff. You just something gets broken. You just go buy a new one. And uh, that is very good for the corporate world. But it, it's not good for humanity. Yeah. So that's... I'm definitely supportive of that and those initiatives. So okay. uh, that's pretty much where we are right now. Open okay, that's, to that's, any that's, thoughts. That's great, Mariam. I, I think when we come back to the Q&A, we'll, I think I'm sure people have a lot of questions here. And I can uh, right away see there are opportunities on multiple fronts, I think, between the UK and, and Sonali Bioplastics, both as a, as a market. So I think uh, as a market for your products. Um, uh, as a technology, so, so replicating your technology here, potentially as an investment source. I think in the Q&A as well, or later on, I'll also bring in Bashir Bai, 
and, and maybe Mozahid to talk about an e-commerce project that we're at the early stages of in the UK. And I can see uh, there's a lot of opportunities to differentiate our UK Bangladesh e-commerce platform by using biodegradable packaging or bag, bags and so on from, from Shanali. But anyway, let's now move on to um, uh, advanced technologies. Ahmad uh, and his colleagues uh, can give some, some, some quick comments and then we'll move on to the two. Uh, Ahmad, do you want to, to jump on? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sivai. Uh, so we are basically advanced dynamics. Uh, we are uh, working in the in the three different sectors mostly. So one is uh, retrofit electric vehicle. Another is uh, like uh, solar battery swapping station. And uh, third is like uh, active mobility. So that is based on smaller vehicle solutions like e-bike and uh, man bike. So I'd like to basically invite my co-founder Tausif to like to present and to, to show you like to go through what we're doing right now and, and what what uh, we are basically planning in the upcoming days. Just please allow some time. You should be able to share now. Share, share your slides if you have any materials. Um, if you buy and everybody else, thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, quite an interesting discussion that's going on, and we're glad to be part of this. Uh, just give me a couple of seconds to. I think you're on mute now as well. Any luck? If you if you're having technical problems, we can we can go to Litu and come back to you. Yes, I think that that'd be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Litu, do you want to to top on now, and then we'll come back to advanced dynamics. Sure, man. Sure, just a minute. Hi, good morning. Um, I have a very small presentation in interest of time. I will finish it quickly, see so if I can share that quickly. So I work um, as trade, I work as a chef. So when we, um, take a block of chrome um, in our hand to cook and see it's traveling nearly five to 6,000 miles. I mean, there are a lot of carbon footprint in there. So we thought, can we actually produce prawn in the UK? It's a warm water prawn. It would require 24 to 26 degree temperature in there. And by using recirculating aquaculture technology. So we have started researching UK and finding out is there anybody doing that? So we found a couple of companies there doing it in a smaller production. So we set up a brand and the name of the brand is Land Ocean Farm. Land Ocean Farm is a circular economy, a farm um, which will utilize the recirculating aquaculture technology and deduce, reuse and recycle strategy would be implemented there. So with that in mind, we thought, can UK actually be import independent? Not only UK, if that model works, it can, be, um, it can be taken to any other country. And the production, processing, and distribution, this supply chain takes a lot of carbon footprint, a lot of carbon tax included in there. So can we actually do that? Can we actually produce and get it from um, farm to fork or farm to kitchen? And the next thing is in the UK, um, the farmers are actually struggling very, very much. So can we actually, can they actually diversify by using a recirculating aquaculture technology with a smaller tank, which will can be produced maximum 10 ton per year. And as a chef, it's, we need to play our role uh, to transform the UK food system, which is the UK government already started a campaign. And I'm gonna come back to that later. So once we set it up, we needed a pilot project and Bangladesh aquaculture is actually 
booming by using, um, well, Bangladesh aquaculture was established a long, long time ago, the conventional way of aquaculture. Now this is going to be land-based very, very much. But most of the farmer, most of the aquaculture, is, it is a hobby project other than a big commercial project where um, we wanted to come in. So we said, okay, can we have a Bay of Bengal aquaculture project? So we set up a pilot project to understand how we can set up a land ocean farm in the UK. Um, so we found a youth uh, in our um, friends and family and we empowered him and we've built up a partnership with the youth and he's managing our farm in Bangladesh. So how we wanted to do that, it biosecure fish production using the circulating aquaculture technology. Why? Because the conventional way of producing prawn, it loses the consistency, it doesn't have a traceability. Because of those two issues, because it's open aquaculture, we mostly depend on Almighty to get this sorted. And the EU um, or UK, uh, if most uh, Western countries, they don't like to accept that prawn because um, looking after the live animal it is very cruel and in terms of the processing and export that has a lot of negativity in there we used to put some sort of inject some sort of jelly in the prong to wake it up a lot more and that didn't help our um our 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 acceptance in there and then the traceability there is a sustainable stream partnership developed by um, IBM using blockchain. Um, they built up a partnership with Latin American, uh, all the prawn farmers from Equator uh, to Brazil. And this traceability by um, scanning a QR code, you would understand the whole supply chain of that prawn or fish or a species coming in. But in Bangladesh, there are a lot of political influences in the prawn farming. I am originally from Khulna and I've seen a lot of ups and downs in the prawn farmer and they lose so much uh, throughout their process. And if you give a pond to a woman and a little bit of fish, that is the biggest way to empowering them. But we want to go and give them sort of a technology as well as the whole first mile and last mile delivery. So they don't need to worry about, they can actually jump in to produce prawn or any other fish in Bangladesh perspectives. So the knowledge we are gathering by um, staying in the UK and at the same time in Bangladesh, we are actually amalgamating and trying to find out can both of the countries be in uh, input independence. The big problem is the supply chain. So from here to there, that's exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to take all of this out. Um, and how we wanted to do that, so our solution would be, first, majority of the prawn farming, if it is not big, it actually buy the breeding, then gets to hatchery, then they hatch it with the post larvae, then this goes out to a growing out um, area from that growing out area it goes to processing area so by implementing this um, technology around uh, recirculating aquaculture technology and a whole farming process um, it will definitely reduce a significant amount of carbon and the same time energy because it will be insulated and it would need a simple solution by tracking to that and can go to the end customer now if that we can implement it in the uk that's a very easy to target all the high-end restaurant who would be interested to use the prawn we wanted to produce the a specific species we wanted to produce here named Letipinus penamai because this is a lot more uh, disease resistance. The next slide we want to talk about the technology we want to develop. The technology is available. It's a 30 years old technology, but there are a lot of innovation gone into there. This technology used um, mostly salmon farming in Scotland. Uh, but traceability, as I said, is the big uh, big issue in terms of exporting prawn from Bangladesh or it, uh, having a prawn farm in the UK. But most importantly in Bangladesh, this technology exists is a buy uh, from the shelf and you plug in, but it does doesn't have fish uh, feed automation technology. So a, um, a person need to be in there 24 seven, we can reduce that by introducing the fish feed automation technology. Um, and then most importantly, the first mile delivery, which is uh, fish feed to post larvae and then brood the stock, then going to the processing farm, followed by the last mile delivery. If we can um, make sure that supply chain is managed through one or two, um, to a stakeholder involved in there, then the traceability reduced quite significantly and we can actually supply to the Europe again. Because in, Bang uh, in the UK, um, 
we import nearly 78,000 tons of prawns and we call it as a grivet um, uh, and uh, shellfish. In, from Bangladesh, we do 4,000 ton of fish in the UK. Um, there are two market leaders, Eurofish and Seamark PLC, but they are actually losing their uh, so much of their supplies because of the low production volume and the availability of land in Bangladesh. Uh, the unique value proposition for both of the farm is quite, um, quite interesting because that will meet all of the sustainable development goal uh, set by United Nations. And this is the campaign United Government started of sustainable local food system. So our production will be recirculating aquaculture that will save so much of water. Uh, it's a land base uh, and protecting ocean from overfishing. And most, uh, as Mariam said, that bioplastic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, microplastic, that actually going into the fish nowadays. So uh, is your fish secure? Yeah, there is a report on the Guardian, it says, is your fish fake? Because there are a lot of fish laundering. I never heard this word. This is the first time I come across with the fish laundering. And then the processing would be um, fresh, local, biosecure. The distribution will follow the zero emission goal, reduce um, the importing fish, and tank to kitchen is our strategy. In terms of accessibility, when we utilize, when we started with the aquaculture, because of the technology, Technology is um, is expensive and is market hasn't developed in the UK yet, so the nutrition doesn't go to the last uh, uh, last uh, of the pyramid, um, last society of the pyramid. Uh, so uh, as we wanted to actually come out from that lot of carbohydrate, but give it to a lot more nutrition to the bottom uh, tier of the society. The land ocean farm or Bay of Bengal aquaculture can play a vital role on there. In terms of a consumption, um, if, we, if we know that healthy people and healthy life would definitely make a significant change in terms of natural environment. And waste recovery, the recirculating aquaculture system is only uh, used three, uh, only dispersed. Uh, uh, 3% water throughout his whole cycle. And there are 17, uh, so out of 17, we got nearly 12 um, sustainable development goal. We can pick it up in terms of utilizing aquaculture for the both of the farm. And my favorite is number 12, responsible consumption, because as a chef, I believe this is re reduce, reuse, and recycle and strategy on number 12 would act a significant value for our development. And um, research, I'm sorry, aquaculture is a community-based project. It has to be built in the community within that. So in Bangladesh, we're working with uh, Kuna University, Kuna Agriculture University, and World Fish. Uh, in, in the UK, we are a member of Royal Agriculture University and a Farm 491. This is an incubator. So I would always, um, always recommend if we are new in terms of aquaculture technology, we need to find out any sort of incubator accelerator who has a lot of experience by developing a lot of partnership they can build in to do that. Um, we were uh, given, uh, well, um, agreed to give us 15 acre of land in a forest of Dean regeneration area where we will be building that uh, uh, land ocean farm. However, in Bangladesh, we do not have a facility to uh, um, actually built a farm and um, using that white leg shrimp because white leg shrimp, um, uh, the government hasn't allowed anybody to start it producing white leg shrimp. But there are two farms, they started as a pilot project, but I think there are a lot of lobbying and by next year, it would be absolutely acceptable. In terms of number of people we would need to work with, uh, Russell, my business partner is leading that project, is a technical director, um, Malcolm was World Fish uh, Director in Bangladesh, and Sadiq is a, a Senior Manager of Farming Future, and Francois uh, and Rod, they work together. So we need a lot of people who has an understanding idea of this aquaculture project, as well as this market, and at the same time, um, how it can be developed. Thank you very much. Any question I will answer when the Q&A comes. Okay, thank you, uh, Litu. That was an excellent presentation, very comprehensive, a lot of uh, you know, food for thought. Um, um, and then also, I think we'll, in the Q&A, we'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, discuss how it can be uh, scaled, uh, maybe there in, in there. So I think the, the third, uh, let's say, case study, and then we'll move to, to Anwar Ali and, and to other speakers uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so third case study is uh, uh, Advanced Dynamics. 
Um, so Ahmed, or uh, are you ready? Uh, yeah, uh, this is Tawsif. Should I share oh, this? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if you guys can uh, see the screen, then I can start. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so as Ahmed uh, said earlier, and I'm sorry about the uh, difficulties, uh, we are Advanced Dynamics um, and our company is an electric vehicle manufacturing company. Uh, we, um, we are working on several aspects of sustainable mobility, uh, but our uh, main goal is that, um, that at, the, in, at the turn of the, at the middle of this, this new century, uh, the way we see transport or the way we utilize transport products will be fundamentally changed. And we, uh, we intend to play a very significant role uh, in, in that transformation. Um, our team started off um, in 2017 um, and uh, our first project was uh, developing a vehicle that would travel 30,000 kilometers across the whole world uh, as, as, uh, as part of a competitive event. From there on, we, we uh, identified that um, uh, electric mobility, the discussion around um, green transport, sustainable transport has been very cornered by, uh, by the Western markets. And most of the solutions and products that we see in the news uh, and in, 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 in Twitter um, and in, in the industrial uh, sort of uh, uh, PR are, are, are all the you know, flashy cutting edge uh, technologies. Uh, we all know about Tesla, uh, and then there are many others like them. And so, so obviously, there's a lot of groundbreaking work being done by those countries. But unfortunately, uh, none of those uh, companies are ever going to target uh, the rest of the world. Uh, so um, according to a World Economic Forum report, uh, by 2030, only 30% of the global fleet will be uh, electrified. And that's only counting the brand new vehicles that people are going to buy um, at that point. And, and at, that, at that time around, there's going to be 1.5 billion vehicles on the road, even then, that are still going to be running on fossil fuel. Uh, and so our goal is to, to change that, to fundamentally reduce that number. Maybe we can't reduce that to completely zero, but we want to change that um, uh, number significantly. And, uh, and our main vision is that by 2050, uh, at least 50% of the global fleet will be regenerative and circular. By what, by, and by that we mean is that vehicles would be able to uh, be able to participate uh, in, in harvesting their own energy, as well as be using materials in their vehicles that are friendly to the, to, to the environment and are also reusable. So the work of Advanced Dynamics is, is built on achieving those goals from a manufacturing point of view. How do we create a manufacturing process that creates products that uh, have a very long life, uh, are, uh, can be repurposed at every different segment of its life cycle, uh, and when it's completely um, um, unusable at its end of life, uh, how do we repurpose the elements into different other applications? So uh, uh, our, all our work is, is based on targeting these things and we are attacking this goal from a manufacturing point of view. So uh, we are creating solutions on three different uh, uh, sort of themes uh, or I would say consumer or, or sort of market themes. The first theme is rapid electrification. As I was just saying that only 30% of the fleet will be electric in 2030. How do we increase this percentage uh, to say maybe 50 or 60%? We need to figure out a way uh, that, uh, that a certain amount of general mass of uh, sort of citizens of the world are able to access uh, clean transportation. And if we, if we sort of follow the incumbent uh, strategy where OEMs like, uh, like uh, Audi, like, like Toyota or like Honda, they create or design products for every one of us, then most of the world will fall behind. And that number is never going to change. So what we are suggesting and what we are working on is to create a global infrastructure plan to be able to convert the existing fleet that's already on the, on the road to electric vehicles. And we are working on the component design, on the powertrain design, and also on the road testing as well. Uh, essentially end-to-end -end, uh, vehicle 
uh, sort of a manufacturing process um, uh, to, to create a solution that's applicable, not just one country, but to, to most countries uh, in the world that's facing the same problems. Um, another additional aspect that we are working is that um, we're not only going to be converting them, the used fossil fuel vehicles to uh, electric, but we're also going to make them solar electric, which is going to be the mainstay of, uh, of green transportation in the future. This is a huge market opportunity. We've already identified that only uh, a certain person, if we only say maybe uh, uh, try to reach maybe 10 or 12 countries in the world, that itself is a $290 billion plus market, uh, which is sort of going uh, un unrecognized by most vehicle uh, manufacturing companies. Um, moving on uh, from solving the rapid electrification problem, we're now thinking about what are we going to do uh, with all the batteries that, uh, that are being used in these vehicles and these slightly larger vehicles. And this is where Bangladesh comes in. Uh, is that we, we are already one of the largest uh, uh, sort of um, concentration of electric vehicles in the world. Most people in the world do not believe that, but if they come to Bangladesh, they'll see at least a million electric three-wheelers uh, uh, outside Dhaka city. Uh, and that's officially, that's the official number. But um, even in that case, what we have identified is that there, is a, uh, there isn't any user adoption problem, but there's a problem of energy distribution. And that connects and ties in very nicely with our earlier theme is that uh, we, we are now uh, working on changing the way that energy is delivered to these 1 million electric three wheelers. Uh, we are introducing, uh, well, by the middle of this year, uh, we're introducing um, a solar powered battery swapping station that's completely disconnected from the grid. Uh, we, are, um, uh, we are placing different uh, sort of stations uh, in, in smaller cities where three-wheelers can come in uh, and they can get pre-charged batteries uh, from these stations for, for an exchange of a small fee through digital payments. And the benefit from them is that these batteries are much more efficient in terms of, uh, in terms of their weight and, and, their, and their power delivery. Um, and so they're getting more mileage. And most importantly, they never, the, the, the end user, they never uh, have to own or maintain battery. The other aspect of this comes from the, from the more administrative side of the, the, uh, the industry is that um, these the three wheelers are currently using lead acid batteries, which has a huge environmental impact. Almost every year, millions of batteries are dumped in, into, into landfills. Our solution uh, extends battery life from uh, what is currently at one year life cycle to an eight year life cycle uh, and possibly even more as the battery technology improves. And more importantly, all of this is traceable, which, is, which means that government agencies are able to track how much energy is consumed and where are all these batteries going to. Finally, uh, uh, I mean, from this theme to, to going into even more sort of a micro uh, sort of a transport solution is how do we enable each individual to travel from point A to B a, in, in a safe and clean way? And that is where active mobility comes in, is where we are upgrading all the bicycles in our cities to electric bikes. Uh, this is already a big phenomenon in, in the West, particularly in, the Europe, in Europe, but we are, we are introducing electric bikes in Bangladesh and other countries as a part of cargo solutions. And, and uh, this itself is a, is, is a massive market which is, is following trends where people would like to have their own mode of transport, but they do not want to own or drive a larger vehicle. Uh, and this, this market is uh, right now, the global market is roughly more than $11 billion. Within this market, we are also uh, creating some new product designs that will enable uh, non-car um, uh, individuals to be able to travel safely. So uh, our three projects, as, as, I, as I was saying, is first is we are working on retrofitting uh, existing vehicles to solar electric vehicles. Uh, ONZE is our, uh, is our project in that side, where in, uh, in Bangladesh, we are currently uh, building 50 uh, uh, light commercial vehicles, uh, completely electric. By the end of this year, we will be launching 25 of these units 
which will be the first time that uh, any electric vehicle or cargo electric vehicle is running on the roads of Bangladesh. Uh, our uh, solar battery swapping project, Cassitex, which, uh, uh, which, were, which was identified as the best uh, climate business solution in the world last year, uh, it has, al has already started operations and we are, we are now exploring different technologies. And uh, as I was saying, from the middle of this year, we'll be launching the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the station operations. And finally, uh, our uh, electric bike and, and, and associated products are already out there and we are doing, doing our business in that sector. Where uh, and we are also designing our own uh, vehicles in that in that segment as well. Um, our projects have already been identified in the in the global sphere. For example, our retrofit uh, solution has been identified as an, uh, as an efficient solution by the Solar Impulse Foundation, which is a global um, uh, sort of uh, network and association of clean tech businesses. We are one of the only two companies in Bangladesh. To have received this uh, this uh, certification, which we got after almost eight months of uh, um, sort of analysis and scrutiny by international experts, um, our solar battery swapping project Cassitex, uh, as I was saying, won the climate launchpad competition last year as the as the best uh, uh, startup in the world, and, and all of this has already been covered in various international media uh, like Sky News. Uh, in, in the UK, which covered the, the battery swapping project as a part of the COP26 uh, uh, daily coverage. And then also Clean Technica, which is one of the main uh, sort of clean tech business, uh, clean tech media in the world, uh, has also covered uh, our, our work. Okay. And, 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 uh, and finally, we are also, in, in order to validate uh, the work that we're doing, we're part of these international associations like uh, the EU Climate KIC, uh, also in the UK, we are part of the Cambridge Clean Tech Program, and and we are we are sort of building these alliances with different uh, different stakeholders and players all over the world. Uh, so the solutions that we are building um, is not just sort of uh, localized into one country, but also that we are able to sort of spread this all over the world. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Tosif. Uh, that's a, I think a very exciting. Uh, you know, I think quite a few different things that you're doing, and I, I, I'm, I, I think I appreciate that you have shared that with us. I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities, and and again, just to, um, I mean, I'll, I'll now bring in some of my fellow Pathfinder um, uh, management committee members, but just to show that this is not just an abstract, or it's not just a webinar that is operating uh, just to have a, a talking shop. Uh, so I think Ahmed, when I think after we 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 started discussing. Um, we mentioned a new e-commerce platform that we're planning to launch in the UK, a group of Pathfinder members. I think that Muzi will talk about that in a minute. Um, we actually, uh, Ahmed contacted me and said, oh, how about an e-bike solution for your UK e-commerce platform when we think about delivery? And we actually talked about it in, 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 in some detail yesterday at yesterday's weekly Pathfinder management meeting. So you can see this connectivity between somebody in Bangladesh who might be manufacturing in Singapore, shipping to the UK. So I think that there is um, uh, really significant opportunities uh, in, in partnership. So maybe now, um, I, if I can uh, bring in maybe, um, uh, I think maybe, uh, I, I think Muzahid, you can talk very briefly about the e-commerce project and then we can go to Anwar uh, Ali Obi to talk about how he sees all of this fitting in to the opportunities for Economic and Urban Regeneration UK, but I, I think, was it, did you, actually, I was going to ask, Anwar, are you under some time constraint? Did you want to speak first, if you need to shoot off? No, you're no, fine. I'm okay. Uh, okay, Muzi, do you want to just jump in and, and give, give some comments on e-commerce project and, and your thoughts, and then we'll move to Anwar, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Anwar, you unmute you yourself, uh, Muzi. Thank you. Always the classic mistake. Um, yeah, hi everybody, and um, pleased to meet you. And so many amazing, amazing conversations taking place uh, since the inception of Pathfinder, and extremely uh, pleased to be amongst uh, uh, such a knowledgeable and experienced and eminent crowd of people. Um, we here in the UK, particularly myself and some of our the younger Pathfinder members, 
uh, are very um, uh, excited about the journey that we've uh, crafted or crafting uh, and clean tech environment um, it is also at the heart of what we do. Um, I myself have been trained by Al Gore as a, a climate reality uh, a leadership corps uh, member uh, in 2013. And so I personally have been going around doing a lot of uh, talks at universities at uh, community level um, to raise the awareness and the profile of the impact of climate change and how communities from grass from the bottom up uh, need to also contribute to the conversation and to the adaptation that needs to take place for a sustainable future. Um, and so very um, um, always learning, of course, um, and uh, hope to contribute more through this particular uh, a group of people and platform. But again, you know, just uh, what Ifti said that we're actually working on an e-commerce platform uh, an e-commerce platform has come about uh, or accelerated as a result of um, uh, what COVID has shown us in terms of supporting um, our entrepreneurs uh, through uh, taking them from uh, developing their products uh, directly to the consumer. So this e-commerce platform, uh, which is being developed by Bashir Bai is um, sort of leading on it as well, um, is to work with Bangladeshi companies to directly bring products into the UK marketplace through the platform uh, and into um, A, directly to the consumer uh, and B, perhaps also work with some other uh, big retailers uh, to take it uh, into a wider marketplace. And again, we are uh, very conscious uh, to be uh, integrated into a circular economy too. Uh, we're also very conscious to ensure that all our um, uh, the businesses and companies that we work with in terms of the products that they will we will be bringing in also are environmentally uh, friendly and meet the standards uh, needed. Um, and, and again, it's a story that resonates with those who are conscious. Uh, the conscious mind and the conscious buyer buy, will buy into uh, the notion of saving the planet, looking after the environment, creating a sustainable future for uh, our future generations. Um, so um, one, of, one, of the, um, one of the projects I work, I'm working on locally and advising is a low carbon community. So we're looking at um, a pilot initiative to support um, properties with um, you know, low carbon heating. We're looking at transportation and e-bikes is something that uh, has been mentioned in the strategy. Uh, so um, I've already messaged uh, Ahmed, Ahmed who's uh, made a, uh, a presentation earlier. And again, similarly with Miriam, uh, we will continue this conversation a little bit later. Uh, to look at some of your products and how they can be brought into this pilot that we're looking at in particular in our local town. Uh, and then once that pilot works, then we can, through our e-commerce platform, we can, you know, redistribute uh, a num number of uh, products, whether they be jute, whether they be uh, fresh produce, whether they be, um, uh, you know, one of our conversations with Professor Momin uh, about, um, garments into the uh, the consumer directly and uh, we we have a great reach and um, pathfinder is central to this uh, spin and this uh, reach into the united kingdom economy particularly within diaspora communities but also within the wider community because between the network members we have access to pretty much government level local government level the private sector and also the um, social enterprise sector, which Anwar will touch on a little bit later. So I'm going to stop there. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, and thanks, Mozid, for you covered a lot in a very, very succinct way, which I always appreciate, Mozid, from you. Um, so let's now move to uh, uh, Anwar Ali Ob. As I mentioned, uh, Anwar Ali, who's the CEO of Upturn, which is based in Oldham, um, and he also received his OBE uh, uh, this year in January um, in recognition of his, his contribution to social business um, and he's also the deputy he's also the deputy chairman of pathfinder as well um, so maybe anwar you can talk uh, we've had a lot of conversations um circular economy clean tech climate what is your i mean there's a lot of opportunities for partnership 
and synergies between Bangladesh and the UK. And we have a, a vision, a plan, uh, and, and we step by step to actually scale some of these ideas in uh, circular economy, urban regeneration, employment generation, economic green digital economic recovery in the UK. So again, these are not abstract concepts. We're putting forward grant applications. We will start reaching out at senior, at senior government levels, and, and most importantly, at, at um, regional city uh, town levels uh, where there is a lot of funding, but people are looking for ideas. So anyway, let me hand it across now to Anwar. Uh, you can be great to get your thoughts and then we'll move to the Q&A. Well, firstly, thanks, Ifti, for such kind words. You know, I always kind of get embarrassed slightly when people mention, you know, personal accolades. Well, just to give you a bit of background, I am a social entrepreneur. I class myself as a social entrepreneur and a social change champion. <clears throat> Having come from the private sector a long time ago, I set up a, a social enterprise for, and a social enterprise, just like any other business, the only difference is I put all my profits back into the community. Now, let's not beat around the bush, and I'm, what I'm going to do today is not hold us back from the Q&A that's just about to start after I've finished, I, I guess. It's taught from the heart, really. I guess, you know, there's lots of conversations today that we've covered, and many, many great points. But ultimately, the elephant in the room is, is mankind. We are, the, we are the, the single biggest cause of all the problems that we are seeing today around the world. So let's not be around the bush. It's not nature creating the problems, it's mankind. Uh, and that, that reflects directly back on, on different communities at different stages as well. And one of the, the biggest problems that I, that I always see is it's a generational thing as well. So most, most of you around this table, are, I'm guessing business owners or entrepreneurs of some nature or degree have been involved in business, but ultimately you're also contributing to the problem because ultimately most businesses, however successful they are, it's at the expense of somebody else. That could be your employees, the environment, whatever it may be. And suddenly we're at this tipping point in the world where that sustainability crisis has now started to affect human beings in a big way and that's why you're probably seeing all the action that's probably possibly been taken because that tipping point has now tipped and we're in a situation now where too many people are suffering so i use the analogy and it's always well documented you know five percent of the population in the world are the richest they have the most wealth 95 percent of the world we're just trying to live and create an environment where we're just trying to support our families and do ordinary things but we're dictated to by vested interest and when in very different levels, you know, whether you're in the UK, Bangladesh or any part of the world, there's some very powerful forces out there that we're not going to be able to change overnight. And we're not going to be able to influence in a way that would alleviate the problems that we face now immediately. But the point that I'm, I'm, I want to get to is we can't just give up either. You know, so there is a movement that is starting to really take shape and it's being driven by that next generation. The younger generation are coming forward and they don't want to do business the way our uh, predecessors have done business. They actually care about the environment. They actually care about their employees a lot more so than other generations that were just driven by profit. So without me kind of coming on as my soapbox and giving lectures, it's, that's not what my intention is. It's just the reality that we are in. And I've spent the last 20 years of my life campaigning, really trying to understand what's happening. And more and more as I come across different conversations, ordinary people just want to do the right thing. It's up to business and the vested interests is kind of change their models. So this is what we're about, I guess. And this is one of the things that attracted me to Pathfinder. We're not going to be able to change the world overnight, but we have to start bringing people together to collaborate, to share ideas, to show there is a different model out there. And if we can do that in step changes, then not over one generation, maybe two or three generations, we might just survive, as I call it. And because there's no guarantees here and we know the vested interests, we know who they are, and we, we are creating solutions that hopefully will go on, but we need bigger solutions. We need to really change the way the economy works, the governments work, and people's issues are addressed. Now, one of the big things that everyone talks about this moment in time is the electrification of vehicles and everything else, all good and well. But down the line, we're also creating a bigger problem as well. You know, we, we kind of, we create one solution, but actually what are the consequences of those solutions? 
how are we going to create all that energy? You know, so every single car in the world goes to electric. How are we going to do that? At what consequence? Again, there's a consequence to all these actions. Now, in a circular economy, what we're trying to do is actually there, there is a different way of doing things. And it starts right here today in this kind of a conversation where we, we hear about the different elements that are starting to appear. It's how do we accelerate that conversation? How do we get more people involved? And more importantly, how do we address the issues of the next generation? Like I've said before, they are totally different in terms of the way they think, the way they want to do business, how they want to work, how they want to contribute to society. So our challenge really today is not necessarily all the, the innovation that's coming forward. It's just to have a, an inward look at ourselves and have a really deep think about what is it that we can do as an individual. And many of us have started that journey and rightly so. But to accelerate that conversation, we have to start collaborating a lot more and starting to join up together as well. So those people in, in our society that feel that they are left behind and those people who feel that our voice is not representing them, they have to be start be center of this conversation as well, because ultimately if we're gonna solve the many, many problems that we have in the world, we're gonna to have to start somewhere and this collaboration work is, is part of the key. Now going on to kind of some of the ideas that I've kind of I've listened to today, again, I'm, I'm very encouraged, but the thing that I would kind of ask you all from today is just to go back and have a think about your own little models that you are coming up with and make sure they are as inclusive as you say they are. And if they're not, ask the question and go back because there is opportunities out there. And the opportunity is this, the world is at this critical stage where only the newest innovative ways of doing things will now start to succeed. And eventually the corporate world will come around that because they're also under severe pressure. Governments are under severe pressure because the, the trajectory is not sustainable. And this is why you're seeing all these initiatives that are coming, coming along. And places like Bangladesh, if we're not careful, will be really left behind in a, in a, in a world that only the, the, you know, the, the richest, the fastest, are currently that's the model. And we have to change that. And this is, this is the challenge put down to all of us. We have a role to change that. We have a role to influence certain conversations and, and my um, biggest attraction to Pathfinder was what I can sit on, the, on my soapbox out here and talk about things, but I have to get involved. I have to influence. I have to show people there's a different way of doing things. And the easiest way to show that is what human nature has always been about. We group together and, it's, and when we come up with solutions together, that's where we can make a real change. So from a business perspective, business is also changing now in that respect. It's very slow at this stage, but it's only solutions that come forward that are truly sustainable that will now start to take off. And with the, the invent of the digital world, we can't avoid news now either. You know, we're in this 24-7 news world as well. So everything's under a lot more scrutiny. But the opportunities are huge for us all to kind of just grasp. So I just want you to, like I said, after today, after listening to everything that we've discussed today, just take five minutes. And even in your own organizations, just think back. My success is based on what fact? It's not just yourself, it's a team of people. Let's make sure that you don't leave anyone behind and you're not doing it at the expense of someone else because that's my biggest fear has always been, you know, all these great ideas, but who's suffering? But who, who are you doing it? You know, who's the person or the community that's gonna be affected by the consequences of your organization's decisions are going forward? With all the right intentions, we're not gonna be able to solve it all. And, I, and that's the power of this connection, the power of bringing different organizations and partners together, because it's only when you get a different perspective that it, it challenges your own. So I would, I would kind of put forward and say, look, the opportunities are vast. They've always been vast. They're not gonna be solved overnight. It's gonna take multi-generational change to really make the impact that we need. But if we sit, sit still and we don't do anything, fine, we'll be okay. Our generation will be fine and possibly the next generation will be fine. But we'll be in a world that's increasingly becoming more volatile and more and more of the ordinary people that I say I try to think about. They're the people who are going to suffer the most. And it's going to be the usual suspects. So in society, I think we have a challenge 
and the business community has that has to take up that challenge on behalf of the people that don't have the voices so again i'm really encouraged by the conversations like i said this is the start for us i guess and as pathfinder i think all we can do is bring people together and showcase some of the opportunities and let's see if we can do it slightly different and my ideal dream would be every single business in the world becomes a social enterprise because then we won't have any issues but i'm also a realist in that in that sense so the opportunity really is down to us as human beings to to take forward the plans that we have currently developing but just think slightly differently and reach out and utilize people like pathfinder and just people around this room or anybody else to spread that message so it's to end on a positive i guess is yes there's lots of these vested interests who have perked up their ear and they're starting to listen to conversations and opportunities have started to open up but it will be down to people like ourselves to reach out and really show a different way of doing things and if we can show that it's it's available and it can be done on a sustainable footing that doesn't leave too many people behind and doesn't create further problems down the line for the world i think that's the future and i think that's the future that we're kind of moving towards very quickly now because we're at that tipping point so i hope like i said if anything it's a heartfelt plea from myself to yourselves I'm not, i don't want to come across that i'm lecturing people because deep down we all know what the elephant in the room is and this is why half of us are around this table as well because we want to do something about that yeah so i'm yeah. very encouraged so i'll pass it back to ifty bye yeah. and please carry on what you what you're all started to do so thank you again thank you um uh, Anwar. in fact i just uh i just wanted to uh, and then we'll go through the q a not digress too much but it just suddenly i, I suddenly had an i i mean we have we're facing I said as Atik Bai was saying this uh you know this 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 confluence of two of the mega shocks of our of our lifetimes of many lifetimes uh, which is which is covid and climate we have climate volatility but we also have potentially social inequality is driving is going to drive social volatility as well or let's say social divisiveness and and that political volatility is only getting bigger so these these slides here uh, well, it, it this shows inequality uh, it's been rising in the US uh, since the 1970s. This is the top 0.01% and the bottom 50% in the US in terms of wealth distribution. Uh, the, the number of billionaires has increased fivefold in the last two decades. But more shocking is that uh, in, 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 in the last one year, the, the billionaire wealth has gone up by $5 trillion to $13 trillion in one year. So you can see here, the next slide, um, the, the super rich have got, I and mean, this shows the percentage of GDP, the billionaire wealth the percentage of GDP. It's from an article from Richard Sharma in the FT. So yeah, we know about Russia, but Sweden, India, US, France, Taiwan, you know, countries we think are, are more equality focused like Sweden and France. It's kind of shocking. Actually, the UK is somewhat down the list. And this next slide, this, this next slide shows the amount of billionaire wealth that's gone up because of the rise in the stock market. Is this because of the genius of billionaires? No, it's actually this massive liquidity, monetary and fiscal liquidity I mentioned before. Uh, that's been the biggest source of billionaire wealth. Uh, and then the last slide I wanted to show, and then we'll go to Q&A. This shows, so when we talk about John Rockefeller, another point that Richard Sharma made in his article, people talk about Ro Robert Barron's at the turn of the century. And, 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 and uh, John Rockefeller's wealth, $331 billion, 1.6% of US GDP. But Spain, Mexico, France, Indonesia, Russia, you know, I mean, it's amazing in Spain, we have the owner of Zara Inditex, it is, you know, Amancio Ortega's wealth is 5.3% of Spain's GDP. Bernard Arno has 5.1% of France's GDP. It's quite shocking. And I think that um, we are in also this tipping point of instability. So I'm sure in the Q&A, we'll have people coming back to them. I don't know whether uh, let's open up now for for q a i mean who wants to start i think but did you want to make a point or before we kick off the q a i think you have to go off mute i think you have to go off mute i think by i think you're on mute uh, I on mute. okay yeah mute. better can you hear me now yes hi yeah. yeah we can hear you yeah good so the critical issue is that uh we have what we've seen in the last or half is excellent real life examples. 
the point that Anwar has made is a very good one. Look at each of those companies saying, how much are you really doing at the end of that? Profit is the essence of business. No profit, business doesn't survive. You have to make profit. But how best you make that and how best you look after environment, the various components that you use, energy system, et cetera, all the environmental attributes, energy, water, uh, emission, ne negative emission, all that. Lastly, how do you do handle the human quality, the employees, the members, the partners, who do you affect? End of the day is the community and better relationship with the community is vital. Uh, we, we talk in terms of community-based adaptation, community-based planning. We say that, but getting the community to get involved is time consuming, takes a lot of effort. It's a skill. It has type of, as Anwar said, it's all a matter of heart. Business is much more a matter of the brain, you know, more, 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 more profit, more bigger, better, better, faster, all those um, adjectives or adverbs. But, uh, you know, is the quality that matters and sustainability is the long-term um, quality development. That's what it is about. And then I think we have seen some very good examples, very good perspective. Let me stop there and get others okay. in. Thank you very much, uh, uh, I think, by Professor. Um, so let's now move into the Q and A. Thanks everybody for sitting patiently. Hopefully, I think the positive thing about we're all zoomed out, but the positive thing about Zoom is hopefully we managed to go for a walk uh, in between the Zoom discussions. At least we're not stuck in a, a conference room for, for 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 almost two hours. So let's look on the bright side. Uh, so maybe now we can, if anybody from the audience wants to make any points or ask any questions, uh, we can do that. And then after that, we'll have some. Uh, closing comments and then then wrap up as i said it's on this is on facebook live we'll share the facebook link i actually think we've managed to cover a lot of very important issues in a relatively short time um so does anybody have anything they want to uh, any questions for any of the speakers or does anybody want to make an additional point uh, if you can use your if you just put your hand up uh okay i can see actually abu side is going to start and then uh so side can start from bcas and then anybody else that wants to ask a question make a point, please just use the, the hand function on uh, on Zoom. So Syed, across to you. Uh, thank you for uh, organizing this uh, nice event and really it was... Uh, Into the speaker, learning. closely. Sound. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? You better. Yeah. Sorry for that. And uh, it was really uh, learning and encouraging as well that uh, what I have heard from this uh, few innovations already shared, are like uh, uh, Mariam Ispahani and uh, Titi Mohitin and also the Tausif's group, it was really encouraging that there are innovations coming from Bangladesh or Bangladeshi diaspora so that that can be scaled in a global scale. So one thing, a suggestion for uh, Mariam's one, I think, uh, you are using uh, jute fiber or other plants. Uh, you may like to consider banana fiber as well, but this is coming a very big way in Bangladesh now, the banana fiber. Uh, and they are now uh, trying to put it in textile industry as well. This is coming in a big way. Uh, okay. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you got, you got a little bit cut off. What is coming in a big way? Banana, banana fiber. Banana fiber. Yeah. Oh, banana. Banana. oh, I had a meeting. I had a meeting about that yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good one. The other thing is that uh, I want to mention to Dr. Atik and uh, Ipi that uh, you know that we had been discussing this circular economy with uh, Athanolism T2 of MP, and I had recent discussion with him as well to take it to the field with some government programs or something like that. And we are going ahead with that one in a pilot scale. And I'm not sure when it is going to the field, but uh, this is maturing well. And this is in the approval process of going to the field. And uh, we are trying to put it in several districts or several upajalas so that the local markets uh, like uh, um, most of you, I, I hope, are uh, Bangladeshi origin, so you know, our heart bazaar we have in rural areas or bazaar towns. So the 
hidden market or vegetable market all this come in a recycle mode or circular economic economy model so that we can bring in all waste uh, processed and we can uh, use solar energy to light them those uh, rural townships and also to uh, recycle the waste generated there whether it is plastic or biodegradable so that is the model okay. we are working on and we are going ahead with that one thank you oh, so okay. much thanks so much uh, so again i don't want to waste plastic but i think your head headset probably needs replacing so uh you know maybe you can find a bi biodegradable new new headset because I, I i think that as a so senior fellow of bcat i think maybe maybe i think i can can gift you uh, an official bcat uh, i forgot <laughs> yeah. i forgot my, to my headset yeah, no, no worries, Laura. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just joking, just joking. So, uh, no, uh, Abu Said is a is a uh, is, is the senior fellow uh, at at BCAS and also has a PhD uh, in I, I think uh, I've forgotten AI in 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 geodynamics from University of Qatar. So, so very well. Is that, is that correct? For the PhD. Is, but, uh, there is some mistake. Uh, I have done my PhD in climate modeling uh, from Norwegian University, and uh, in fact, my Earlier degrees, postgraduate degrees as geoinformatics and geomatic engineering. Okay. okay, thank you. So let me just now jump in. Uh, I think Nasimul Kabir would like to make a quick comment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a question uh, to Tausif Bhai. Uh, this is very, very fantastic um, concept you have been developing. I hope you, it's been in operational in Bangladesh uh, in the mid June, you had saying. <clears throat> so I'm in the battery industry for like uh, 10, 11 years. I worked in Rahim of Rose. So lead acid battery is basically the most uh, advanced technology in Bangladesh. So far, so good. But the lithium has been uh, at the verge of uh, established establishment or the penetrating uh, phase in Bangladesh. So you are saying that you are going to increase the life of the lead acid battery to eight years. If what I, if I can understand, if you say that. Um, yeah, so no, 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 I think, uh, I think I misspoke. We are uh, increasing the life of the vehicle battery, but uh, so essentially we're replacing lead acid with lithium ion. Right, That's right, right. Okay, okay. So uh, I think you should also consider the uh, fact of, uh, the fact in the market is running right now. Uh, I'll be glad if your uh, cassette technology uh, business model worked out in real life uh, swapping the battery because uh, the battery price has been there's a reselling price of the battery so all the rickshaw pullers or the easy bike are actually have that calculated the cost of the battery when this resale it resell the battery so i hope you you have this in your mind when you develop this uh, model um, but the thing is, when there's a, uh, whatever I feel like, uh, when there's a, there's a transmission, transformation of the technology from uh, the old to new technology, there's a cost of this technology uh, transformation. We don't actually calculate in the project when we do it. Like if you, all of a sudden you come up with a lithium technology and you sell it to the market, but it's not gonna work in that way. So we, there's a cost to trans transform it from lead acid to uh, lithium. So there are uh, a small bits of people are encouraging with a uh, new technology and trying to uh, insert it in the market, but they're not actually able to penetrate because they don't actually count the cost of this transformation. Number one. Yeah, so, so, so what I would suggest uh, is, is just in the interest of time. I right. think uh, we can also, I would encourage after this call uh, right. for, for people yeah. to also have some, let's say bilateral or sm smaller group discussions. Sorry, so okay, I'll add okay. you, in, in fact, in the clean tech, Pathfinder clean tech WhatsApp group, if anybody's not on the Pathfinder clean tech WhatsApp group, please uh, message me uh, or, or, or put something in the chat and we'll add you there and, and you can then get each other's WhatsApp and have a separate discussion. Um, sure. uh, I think now Jamala wanted to make a, 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 a quick, uh, quick comment, Jamal. Um, who's the, who's hello. The, <laughs> yep. who's the treasurer, treasurer of Pathfinder and also the MD of IBCS Path uh, of, of IBCS Primax in Bangladesh, but but based in the UK. So Jamal, please go ahead. Um, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it was very insightful. Um, 
I, I'm a complete novice in this area, but um, the conversations, um, you know, it, it inspired me. Um, I think the advantage that we have in Pathfinder is we have, <clears throat> we have a strong network and we have a lot of people who have access to decision makers, both locally and in the political arena in the UK. Now, with regards to, I think it was Miriam and also advanced technologies, it, it looks like you have, you have some, you know, well thought out solutions there. I think if we want to position it, we need to come up with a combined, um, a combined plan to position it to the UK government with a certain caveat that as Anwar alluded to, it has to benefit the local community. Um, if you want to enter into the UK market, um, it's, it's the same dynamics as in Bangladesh. What advantage does the local community get? If all the money is going to be repatriated out of the local communities, then I see no, no value proposition. Um, but if there is a value proposition where we can position it in the UK and leverage the skills in Bangladesh or abroad, then I think um, we should definitely have a strategic meeting on how we approach decision makers <clears throat> and draw up a 360 design plan. Um, and that will be very fruitful because as IFTI said, the government is very focused in this area. Um, and it would be uh, easy to position ourselves with decision makers if we have a solution that solves the problem. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, yeah, I, I think just to uh, uh, echo and, and reinforce what uh, Jamal is saying, I, I would say that um, uh, we should have a, a clear focus after this webinar. We have a target. We have to help. You know, we're all, I mean, many of us are business people as well. Let's, let's hold ourselves to account. We should have, if we can generate 10 new uh, clean tech circular economy businesses in the UK in collaboration with Bangladesh before the end of this year uh, and launch them, I think that is eminently feasible uh, and uh, it will be mutually beneficial and mutually reinforcing. Uh, launching an e-bike e program in, in, it can be in the Manchester, it can be in Birmingham. You know, Bashir Bay is reaching out to Andy Street, the mayor of, of, of Birmingham for our e-commerce project. And, and B2B2 C RMG Garments project. Anwar uh, uh, Ali has a good relationship with Andy Burnham, uh, the mayor of Manchester. These regional mayors are extremely influential and are looking for digital innovation, green, tech, green, green technology, and, and circular and sustainable ideas that generate jobs in a, in a sustainable way. And, it, and, and so, um, as Jamal was saying, we have a lot of opportunities, but they have to be specific focus projects, which benefit the community and also we can we can so I think that after today's discussion I mean we have three case studies and I think all three are, are both can be implemented at a local regional and nationally and probably international but we can have some a very uh, help we can work together to develop a business plan uh, and a proposal that we can put uh, and I think there is as I said no shortage of money uh, we just need to be very uh, organized focused disciplined uh, in, in the way that we think and propose these ideas. Um, does somebody else, anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, and if, then... Yeah, I just wanted to add that yes. um, one, one element of our conversation, uh, if we just add, is that, um, of course, post-Brexit, uh, the current government uh, of the UK are looking to build back better, stronger and greener. And I think Pathfinder being um, the catalyst um, to work with companies in Bangladesh and bring them into the UK and Europe uh, could be a game changer in the way we go forward. So that's great. And I, I, I must say all three ideas that we, uh, should, I mean, I think that advanced dynamics and sorry, I, I think I said advanced technology as well. It's actually advanced dynamics. It's like when I, when I said the call was going to happen at 3.30 a.m. Bangladesh time. I think uh, uh, Zoom overload, but um, I, I think that we, I think today we um, covered a lot. Um, I, I, let me actually just ask Bashirbhai to make, give, give his comments and then, and then I'll wrap up because I think I'm always cognizant. When we get to the two hour mark for a webinar, um, I think that it's, 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 it's a good time to be uh, gradually wrapping up. But, but Bashirbhai, do you want to make any concluding comments then I'll wrap up? Uh, thank, thank you, Ifti. Uh, I think, um, uh, Professor Atik Rahman, Anwar Ali, and um, Professor Mohammed Mumen, and our 
participants, speakers uh, cover most of the circular econ economy business. Uh, I, I just would like to highlight um, two points uh, about the awareness within the community. Yes, uh, as a business is our responsibility to look after the environment, but uh, we need to spread as an orally very delicately put this word uh, to, uh, towards us that we, we need to uh, promote and, and, and publish within the community. Nowadays, it's becoming really um, the, um, the very dangerous uh, about if you, if, you, if, you, if you hear about it that uh, oxygen-free dead zone is uh, um, started to emerge at the water of uh, near to the uh, Sweden Baltic Sea. Uh, so this is really very scaring, uh, scaring news. And uh, also the uh, Professor Ramon mentioned about the recycling uh, of the cloth. As we all know, the excessive production of the uh, clothing, excess use of the clothing, uh, Japan is already ahead and uh, they are recycling the old, uh, old cloth and redesigning from the, from the old, old clothes. And I, I think that uh, uh, Bangladesh and UK uh, are actually leading towards the, towards the right direction. But there are, uh, as you know, we cannot depend on, on, on the country and, uh, and, and the corporate houses and, and the business community. We need to involve uh, our public and that could be only done by through the institutions like we all have. Uh, and and we, are, we are going towards the right, right, right direction, direction, of course. I think that uh, um, the Pathfinder and British uh, Chamber of Bangladesh Chamber of Commerce can can contribute uh, uh, more as the institutions um, about this. And I I like to thank you everyone for for your participation within the very sh short notice. Is actually credit goes to Ifti in mobilizing, pushing us uh, towards uh, so many webinars and and Zoom meetings. And um, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you that uh, today, 3.30 p.m. Uh, UK time, we are, our BBC CI team actually interviewing our former governor of Bangladesh Bank, uh, Mr. Atik, uh, Atik Rahman, regarding, of course, the circular economy and some of the content will emerge. And I, I would like to invite you, if it's convenient, you can watch that program on the BBC CI Facebook. Thank you once again, and I for a tweet. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. Before I wrap up, I just wanted to quickly bring in Abdus Hamid, who's also a, a board member of Pathfinder, uh, is also on the Conservative Party Technology Forum. Um, so, uh, Abdus, did you want to make a yeah, quick comment and I'll wrap up? Please go. No, thank, th thanks, Sifti, for giving me the opportunity, and, and thank you for all the uh, prominent speakers for um, uh, presenting their initiative. It's a, you know, for me, it's a, definitely an eye opener. It's an area that I don't really know much about, but um, Having listened to um, two of the um, businesses that are, uh, you know, making a lot of um, groundbreaking uh, 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 business decisions in Bangladesh, what I wanted to basically find out from uh, uh, both Mariam and uh, Tosif by, um, from Advanced Dynamics is whether there would be any consideration in future to see if, um, you know, whether you'd be whether you'd be willing to maybe look at. The UK as an option to maybe starting up some sort of a research facility, or especially from let's say for example as advanced dynamics perspective, maybe a small a small uh, plant uh, based uh, solution in the UK. The reason why I say this is because there are a lot of initiative, even locally, like for example let's say London, um, they have the ultra low emission zone um, policy. And uh, these, are kind, these are kind of things that will allow businesses like, for example, say Advanced Dynamics to really be able to promote uh, your uh, vehicles in the UK. Um, but it's, it's difficult. It, it is very difficult for Bangladeshi companies to try to break in to the UK unless you have some sort of an arm within, uh, within the UK. I know Professor Atik did mention that basically UK is probably not the player that it was once. Uh, being out of the EU, but I still think that the UK, you know, is at the forefront uh, um, of a lot of uh, uh, areas. So I think maybe that's something to maybe for you to consider. And also it allows um, businesses like yourself to basically show that you're creating jobs, particularly locally.
And then this then basically filters back into the economy as well. So it's maybe something to think about, but there are a lot of opportunity um, uh, within the UK, especially for businesses like Shunali Bioplastic and for um, Adv Advanced Dynamics. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very so much. Should I, should I answer that or should I just uh, I think we can connect make, with them offline? Yeah, I think probably connect offline. Uh, okay. we, in fact, we, we can have a, I said connect offline. We can, I, I'm always happy to be part of that. We can have a smaller, smaller focused discussion. So that's, that's, I think we can, what I would really conclude by saying, again, just not to drag out the conversation is to uh, emphasize that this is, this conversation today is, as Anwar was saying, it, it's a start. We can all see there are, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, as Jamal highlighted, we need to translate this discussion into actual hard proposals that we can take to government, to local, to, 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 local, to regional mayors, to local councils in the UK. Um, there is a lot of, lot of different pots of funding. We can also take these, let's say, 10 of our best uh, circular economy, clean tech ideas to the COP26 proposals. So uh, around that time, we can have some, some firm and maybe we'll have started some pilots. I think that we can also follow up with a, uh, maybe a discussion. It can be uh, hosted by IBA, it doesn't, I mean, it can be an IBA Pathfinder event in the next month or so, um, where we can discuss some of the business side of this. Alternatively, I, I think another very important area, which I think uh, Professor uh, Momen, Momen is exactly up, you know, I think you, uh, perfect for you taking over as director of IBA, we can have a discussion about B2C for RMG in the UK, but with a particular focus on how can we brand uh, and have kind of a spearhead of, of sustainable production and, uh, and, and uh, you know, Bangladesh garments, changing the narrative for Bangladesh garments to also be uh, showcasing both social, uh, social initiatives in, in the garment sector and also green initiatives. Uh, and some of the things that uh, Atik Bai has highlighted. So maybe we can organize that in June. Uh, we can have a, you know, by that stage, I think maybe our uh, e-commerce platform that we're discussing that Bashir Bai and Muzahid mentioned, and we're gonna work with Pride Group as let's say a pilot for, for, for garments, we can, we can bring in other people as well. So I think these things are all tied together. This is an important thing. It's important for Bangladesh garment sector to go directly B2C. Everybody agrees that there's consensus. We're, we have to do, go, go through modalities in the implementation plan. There's also a, a clear recognition that uh, maybe the perception of Bangladeshi garments is, is low cost, cheap. Um, what is going to be the USP or the, or, or the, the branding or the concept that's going to take us B2C in garments uh, for, from, from Bangladesh to the UK and therefore into other markets? So I think, um, you know, sustainable production, green, uh, some of these uh, environmental innovations uh, can be something else. So we can maybe do that, uh, I think, Professor, we can plan on that in, in June uh, and, and take a month or so to, to plan another event. But I think we made, we covered a lot of, um, uh, you know, important issues. I think there's a lot of scope for follow-up. Um, please do, um, we'll share the Facebook live uh, video um, and, and also we may even upload it to Pathfinder's YouTube channel as well. So you can share that with other people uh, in the discussion. I know many of you have very patiently listened for over two hours now. Um, uh, you know, Mata Pai from Newcastle and many others um, who are influential business people in the UK. Uh, I, I would I, I also like to emphasize that um, the commitment, not just from Pathfinder, but from all of the business people in the UK that are on the call is serious. So th there is no uh, tension between, there's no mutually, it's not a mutually exclusive. These are compelling commercial and business opportunities that can also have a sustainable impact and can also create a green and sustainable digital recovery. These are not mutually exclusive. And even on, in, on, on social inequality, we can also bring in the communities to create jobs for most of the underprivileged youth, unemployed youth uh, in the UK and indeed in Bangladesh. And if we generate profits from these businesses, of course, I hope that um, through Pathfinder or other organizations, uh, these businesses can also make a CSR contribution uh, to, to reducing social inequality. So um, I, again, wanted to wrap up. I know we've talked for, for almost two hours and 15 minutes, but I think we had a very rich and, and very um, important discussion. Um, and let's follow up and stay in touch in the Pathfinder groups. And, and if anybody after today's discussion would like to have some follow-up discussions, feel free to reach out to each other bilaterally, or if you'd like to have a, a smaller group discussion, 
it can be a half an hour discussion on, on Zoom on a particular topic, right. please let me know. So uh, think, thank you again, you, you, uh, Just Sorry, one please. point, would you mind you uh, doing a short summary of some sort of even bulletized would be helpful. I don't know whether that's possible. Uh, yeah, we, I, I can do that. I'll, I'll, I'll do that and also share the, the, the PowerPoint as yeah. well uh, that Thank I gave today. Right. So thanks thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for your time in, in Bangladesh. Have a good uh, late afternoon, evening in Bangladesh and, 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 a, re and a good, good rest of the weekend in the UK. So thanks take again, care. everybody, and take care. Best, bye -bye. best wishes, everybody. Take care. Bye -bye. And stay safe. Be safe. Yep.